So the window that we're looking at here by default will show your most recently opened projects. Sometimes you'll get a screen that's completely greyed out with a red circle in because it's struggled to load up that information. I'm looking at Harry's machine right now which looks a lot like that and some of the rest of you might have a screen that looks like that. If you have ended up with a quite greyed out screen with just a red circle in the corner, just take your mouse threateningly towards the red circle in the top left corner, drag it across the box and it should be enough to wake it up and load up all your most recently opened files. You've got to drag it, you've got to drag it across the window. So start maybe in the bottom right corner of that window, Harry, and then drag it up. There you go. Okay. I have no idea why that works. Um, now, the longer you the longer you work on Premiere, the more projects you're probably going to have that are called things like Untitled Project, Untitled Projects, Untitled Project 3, 4, 5, 6, 12, 15, 21. And then you'll come up with things like Delete Project 1, Delete Project 2, and you'll have an awful naming convention. It's probably better we get past that right now. It is good to save multiple copies of the same project file as long as it's an update on the previous one. Um, so we'll do that within new project, Ethan. More often than not with what we're doing, you're going to want to start a new project. So that is as simple as hitting the new project button and at that point giving it a name and a place to save it. Now you put the name in the name field, which seems quite simplistic, I know, but you can do a screen grab of that for me as well. Um, we'll call this one Jigsaw Edit. Jigsaw Edit V1. And then you're going to want to make a folder into your documents area. And we'll call that something like post-production. And then we'll make a folder within there and call it Jigsaw Edit. Now there's some other information on this screen that is quite useful. Um, the video, audio and capture settings are asking us how we want the information being displayed on the screen. If you're working with film, then you'll probably want it to be feet and frames, either 16mm or 35mm, depending on what you're working on. The likelihood of working on film at college is pretty low. We're going to want to work on a time code basis. That's far more useful to us. Um, the display format for audio will either be in audio timing or milliseconds. Again, it's better to have it in audio samples. And the capture format will default to DV, but we haven't really needed capture format for about 10 years, so you can ignore that. Um, you've also got multiple tabs in there, so you've got a scratch disks tab, which while you're at college isn't that useful, but when you're working on Premiere at home, if you're working on Premiere at home, the scratch disk area is really useful. What the scratch disk does is it takes over part of your hard drive and it uses that as RAM, so if you're doing any rendering, it will use part of your hard drive in line with your RAM. If at any point you find that Premiere just can't cope anymore, you need to give it more space on the scratch disk. And finally, the ingest settings. You can set that up to duplicate files, but we don't really need to do that. And it's set by default to be disabled. And we'll hit OK, and it will load up Premiere for us. Once we've got Premiere open, if you can take a screen grab of it, that would be wonderful. But what we've got in Premiere is two things that are really important. We've got a series of workspaces and we've got a series of panels. And it's important to know the difference between the two. The workspaces are across the top of the screen. You've got a learning workspace, an assembly workspace, an editing workspace, colour effects, audio graphics, libraries, and there's even more. And not only that, you can create your own workspaces. Uh, or you can just completely kill Premiere. Come on, Premiere, come back. Now, generally speaking, we're going to work 
mostly in the first little while between editing and colour. Has it crashed again? Restart it again. Sorry, you, you're stuck on that vicious cycle for now, I'm afraid. Hi right, Ben, I got a message. So we're mostly going to be working between editing, effects, and then as we move up we'll start to use graphics and we'll start to use colour. Um, I'm not sure I've ever used the assembly one, I think it's quite a, a more basic app style editing program. Um, but what I want to do is really talk to you about the different panels that we've got. <coughs> so, I'm going to go in a clockwise order from the bottom left position of the screen. But to start with, we're going to need to get some media in. So if you guys can go to iSight and you want to download a file from the skills carousel area. Called Nursery Rhyme Remix. If you, if you click the pink the pinky purple button that says skills carousel, it will take you directly to the skills carousel section. There's a folder that's called um, introduction to Premiere at the top of the post-production section. And there's one file. Just download that file and leave it downloaded in the background and I'll take you through the different panels and what they do. You can work in there. Yeah. All right, so while that's downloading, while that's downloading, I'd like to talk you through the different panels. And on your PowerPoint file, you can annotate those panels, as in you can put notes around them to show what they are. So this bottom left window to start with, this is your project window. It will contain all of the assets that make up any of your projects. So if you bring in images, if you bring in soundtracks, if you bring in um, motion graphics, bring in video clips, archive footage, that's all going to live in your project area. It can get quite messy. You've got a little button at the bottom of it, of it for a folder and that's called a new bin. Within film editing we refer to our folders as bins. It's kind of historical because we used to put actual film within a metal bin to stop it setting on fire if we accidentally dropped our cigarettes on it. However, we just kept the name so it's still referred to as a bin. So if you're working on a feature film and you've got maybe like 16, 18 scenes you'll probably want to organize each scene by a bin if you're working on a music video and you've shot over eight locations, you'll probably want to organize your clips by location. So you'll just create a bin for each location or a bin for each scene. Uh, onto the course page, so film, TV and creative media practice. Click on that. Then click on skills carousel in the middle. And then scroll down. Scroll down. I think it's inverted. And then first, first one under introduction to Premiere. Click into that and then get the file. Now the file that I've given you is um, a nursery rhyme remix file. I'm just going to unplug you from this, Chris, so we can all. There once was a girl named Goldilocks who, while walking in the forest one day, came upon a house. It's a bit creepy. Now to get the video file into that area of the screen, I've just double clicked it. Rather than double clicking it, I could have dragged it in. But this monitor here on the top left is really important. This is your preview monitor. Again guys, I don't want to be talking over you, I want you listening to this. So if I can hear you guys playing that track, I know that you're not really listening in. The preview monitor in the top left corner will always give us a clean version of our file. Now, what I mean by a clean version of the file is if you've gone through and you've put any effects on it, or you've colour changed it or anything like that, 
double clicking the asset in the project window will always load up the original. That's quite useful if you need to check it side by side with what the edit you've done is, if you want to check that your colours have improved. So it's a really important window. We can also use this space for editing. We'll use it for marking our in and out points, but we can also use the timeline for that. Within the top left panel, you'll also have effect controls, which will be greyed out right now because we don't have a timeline, but we'll come back to that. Then you get an audio clip mixer, which the more audio tracks you have on your timeline, the more audio sliders you'll get for it. So what we're going to need is a timeline. Now, we can edit directly on the timeline. It, it's quite, um, what's the word? It, it's sometimes an efficient way of doing things. It's sometimes a less efficient way of doing things. It just depends on the project you're working on. OK, can I come back to that and solve that in a bit more? So there's, there's two ways of making a timeline. You can either make a timeline that you're in charge of, or you can make a timeline that the file's in charge of. And that will depend entirely on what you want to achieve. So if I know that I'm creating a video and I want to output it at 1080, I'll click the new item icon and I'll choose sequence. For those of you that are playing through the clip, you are not listening. If I choose new sequence, I can go through the settings and I can choose DSLR 1080p at 25. And what's important here is that I can give it a name. Now there is another way of making the sequence, which is uh, what a lot of people will do, which is you just drag the clip over to the timeline area. By doing that, it will put the whole clip onto the timeline. Now the issue that we've got now is, one, our timeline is called whatever the clip is that we've just dragged over, which is all well and good when there's only one clip, but if you've imported 50 shots from a camera and your sequence happens to be called clip underscore 108F7C21, the likelihood of you finding your timeline if you close it is pretty slim. So it's important you know what your timeline is called. The second problem we've got is we've got no idea what size this timeline is. The size of the timeline is completely dependent on the video we've put on it. So if we've been out on the shoot and we've shot some footage at 4K and we've shot some footage at 1080 and some footage at 720 and you make a 4K timeline, everything else is going to look really small. Or, conversely, if we make a 720 timeline, because we drag that clip on, everything's going to look really big. Because it's going to look like we zoom in on it. So it's important that we're in control of our sequence size. So I would strongly advise avoiding dragging the clip over onto the timeline area. Just click on the new item and choose sequence. And then you can configure it as to whatever you want. And I'm going to call this... Uh, Jigsaw test timeline. And at that point, I can drag my clip in and we can, it'll, it'll tell me that it wants to change the sequence settings, but I want to override that because I want to be in charge of it. So I'm going to keep settings. And at that point, we'll see what size the video clip is actually in relation to 1080, which is going to change things about quite a bit. Yeah, if you, if you guys can see on my screen, I'll, uh, I'll put that into context for you a little bit. Let's make a new colour map and shove that behind it so you can see quite how small it is. Okay, can you see how big the actual video clip is in relation to 1080? Why does that happen? Because the video is exported at a tiny image size. Mostly because it was ripped off YouTube. So it's probably about 480 at the biggest. Um, so what we can do is we can scale that up, but if we scale it up, we're going to pixelate it. And there's other ways around it, and we'll, we'll talk through them in the future. So you can either work on it in real size, or you can work on it on a 1080 timeline. That's kind of up to you and what you want to do with it. However, for the sake of today, I think we should be working on 1080. Now, I want to go through two different methods of editing with you. One will be the edit, the method that I'm pretty sure you're all comfortable with, and we'll spend a little bit of time editing it that way. And then the other way is a, is a way that in some ways is more efficient, um, and I'm going to show you that way second. So the first way, you need two shortcuts. Well, you don't need them, but they'll make your life a lot easier. Um, can I have a show of hands, firstly, if you are right-handed?
Yeah, you're not the only one, though. There's a, there's a few left handed people. Okay, that's fine. And a show of hands if you tend to use the mouse right handedly. So I know some left handed people will still use a mouse like a right handed person. Okay, that's pretty much all of you. That's absolutely fine. Um, the only reason I was asking, a lot of people when they're editing, I've seen this over the years, I've taught this kind of stuff, have the mouse in the right hand, and they never really know what to do with the left hand. It's almost like a tool that's unnecessary. It's almost like it's just in the way. Your left hand's for shortcuts. There's a lot of shortcuts in Premiere that make your life easier. Two shortcuts that you want right now is C and B. What C will do is lift up this tool here called the razor tool. C is for cut. And if you go along on your video clip and you click it, you'll put cuts into it. Every cut you make will create a new section of video. Which V will select them and then you can move them around, right? For anybody who's done any editing on apps or directly on your phone, this will kind of be the, the stock way that we've done it. So C to cut, V to select. What I'd like each of you to do to start with is to plug your headphones in so we're not all listening to the same slightly different part of a different track. I'd like you to take that clip of video that I've given you, I'd like you to cut it up into its constituent parts, and I would like you to edit it together into a linear, coherent nursery rhyme. There are three nursery rhymes buried within it, you only need to put one of them together. I can.